We build the culture in government that stimulates the innovation and thought leadership that once earned us the title of a development superpower. Together, we'll build economies and public services that allow host nations to invest in their people and create the next generation of leaders and innovators at home to tackle underlying debt and harness technology so we all benefit from the clean energy revolution. We do this because it's the right thing to do and because it's the only thing to do. Security at home depends on stronger global partnerships to tackle the growing influence of Russia and China. Honesty about immigration means recognising and tackling the poverty and climate change and conflict which force people to move. Good jobs here in Britain rely on pioneers like the scientists in Oxford whose malaria vaccine will save countless lives overseas and create opportunities at home. Reconnecting Britain to the world so we can face the future together. And conference, I tell you today that my absolute priority will be to embolden and empower women and girls in every part of the world. In 2023, that 130 million girls are still denied the right to education and women hold just 25% of parliamentary seats worldwide and one in three of us endures physical or sexual violence at least once in our lifetime is not inevitable. So we will stand with the women who are changing the world and put them at the heart of everything that we do. With the women in Ghana and Bangladesh, who against all odds are becoming engineers and innovators, transforming their countries. And with the brave women from Belarus to Afghanistan who are rising up to demand not just rights, but political power. Let the message from this hall ring loud and clear. If you look the other way, a sexual violence is used as a weapon of war. If you deny us education, deny us the vote, deny us opportunity, if you attack women's rights anywhere, then you attack them everywhere and we will not stand for it because women's rights are human rights and human rights are non-negotiable. We know that by the strength of our common endeavour, we achieve more than we achieve alone. That is why we will reject the false choices and stand with our friends across the world once more. Never let them say it can't be done. We are the party that gave the world the first ever Climate Change Act. We introduced civil partnerships here at home and we flew the pride flag over British embassies in countries where loving who you love is a crime. We lifted a million children out of poverty here in the UK and three million a year every year overseas. We opened up university education to a generation of children at home and we helped 40 million children into school worldwide. We were the light on the hill for people at home and overseas. That is what it means to give Britain its future back. So we will go out with courage and conviction and build the country and the world we want to see. And we will do it the only way that counts together. Thank you.
Thank you, Lisa. That, that, that was brilliant and um, concludes the international debate. I'm, I'm really proud of, uh, 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 of the conference today for all the contributions, both from the platform and the floor. Um, ta yeah, we, we, we live in, in very scary times with the horrific terrorist attacks that have just happened in Israel and the war that's ongoing, the people of Ukraine fighting for their, fighting for their freedom. And I think the speeches today were really of appropriate seriousness uh, given, that, given that backdrop. The votes on those two composite motions will be at the end of the, of the morning session. And I'm now going to leave the chair and hand it over to my friend, Wendy Nichols. Good morning, conference. We're now moving on to our first mission plenary um, on growth for higher living standards. This session includes three composite motions, critical infrastructure, industrial strategy, education and skills, and social care workforce. The debate will continue on this session after lunch, and it will then include a composite motion on technology and AI in the workplace. We will also have speeches from Thangam De Debener, that's the Yorkshire twang, I can't get around that, Peter Kyle, and of course, Rachel Reeves. But first to open the debate is Liz Kendall. Thank you, Liz. <clears throat> Conference. I've spent my life tackling poverty and inequality and as Labour's Shadow Work and Pensions Secretary, that's what I'll do again. Working with colleagues across our party to provide opportunity and security for all. All around us, every day, we see the costs of Tory failure. Parents working 12-hour shifts in shops and cafes, but struggling to pay basic bills. Mums forced to give up work because they cannot afford childcare. A country where there are now more food banks than police stations. This must end. <clears throat> Last week saw an endless parade of Tories claim they are the party of freedom. Do me a favour. The Tories have starved so many people of opportunities, of hope. That's what poverty and insecurity does. And it is our job, Labour's job, to set people free. Real freedom means going as far as you want in life. But today, too much of your future is still determined by where you're born, your class, your gender, and the colour of your skin. Because Tory freedom is tax cuts for the rich and benefit cuts for the poor. <clears throat> now, Labour knows real freedom and real prosperity starts with working people. It's built from the bottom up and the middle out. And when the working classes and the middle classes prosper, our country prospers too. So we must harness our greatest asset, the talents of the British people. Too much talent is wasted today. Poverty is soaring. And the cost to the taxpayer is spiralling too. Conference, Britain isn't working. Over two million people shut out of the workplace because of sickness or disability, want to work. The over 50s, especially women, struggling with poor physical health and caring responsibilities. Young people with mental health problems, lacking basic qualifications, on the back foot before they've even begun. Under Labour, this will change. 
our top priority will be ensuring everyone who can work does, because we believe the benefits of work go beyond a payslip and in the dignity and self-respect good work brings. So we will tear down the barriers to success. We'll tackle the root causes of worklessness, recruiting thousands more mental health staff and overhauling skills so no one is ever written off again, whatever their age. We'll transform employment support so it's tailored to individual and local needs, families and communities doing well together. And because there should be no limits to the ambitions of working people, transforming the quality of work will be a driving mission. Only two things ever stop you living on poverty pay, the law, and a trade union membership card in your pocket. And Labour will strengthen both. <laughs> Our New Deal for working people will cut poverty, increase wages and improve workers' rights. And we'll make sweeping changes to job centres so they don't just help people get work, but get on in their work. This is our contract with the British people. Real opportunities matched by the responsibility to take them up because that's what true fairness is all about. And conference will deliver real security too. The last Labour government lifted two million children and pensioners out of poverty. Today, our ambition is undiminished, our resolution redoubled. So we will reform universal credit to protect people when they need it and to genuinely make work pay. We will champion equality for disabled people and we will deliver a bold, new, cross-government, child poverty strategy and ensure decent state and second pensions for all. <laughs> now, conference, despite all the problems and challenges we face, I am optimistic and hopeful about the future because I see the talents and, above all, the decency of the British people. They need a government that is on their side and that is what Labour will deliver. And to the country, I say, our mission will be to set you free, to provide the opportunities you need to live the life you choose and the security to make that freedom real. Together, we will build a brighter Britain and give our country its future back. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And we move now on to the composites. And the first is composite three. Um, Unite to move and as left to second. Can I ask someone from as left to come down? And then can I have the movers and seconders of the next two compatite, compatites, composites, um, GMB and community and Unison and Doncaster Central so that we can try and move. Thanks. Sharon Graham unites moving composite three. Friends, I want to start by thanking all workers in Britain who fought the profiteers as well as this shameful government, who put the stake in the ground, workers who took action and are taking action at great personal cost, who made the choice to put others before themselves 
and defend working people from the biggest attack on living standards in generations. Friends, let's send our support from this hall today to NHS workers, bus workers, railway workers, steel workers, teachers and many more besides. Thank you for what you do. Solidarity to you all. And friends, friends, how did we get here? A two trillion pound economy, the sixth richest economy in the world, where workers and communities are merely existing and we don't even own our most basic of needs. The big question for the next government is who pays for the crisis? Because it certainly cannot be the same everyday men and women who paid for the last one. The financial crash in 2008, that pain was not shared. 10 years of austerity, 10 years of pay cuts, and 10 years of devastated communities. And then who was it who went out in the pandemic to save lives and keep food coming in? Those same ordinary men and women. And how were they rewarded? Pay cut after pay cut after pay cut. So friends, friends, our economy is broken. This Tory government has done exactly what it says on the Tory tin, make the rich richer and enable rampant profiteering. But Labour's mission is fundamentally different. Labour's job is to be the voice of workers and our communities, and yes, to make different choices. We must take our energy back into public hands. <laughs> Conference. Conference in France, in France they own their own energy, which has meant lower bills for the French people. While in Britain, we have let energy monopolies fill their boots by picking the pockets of UK workers, how they must have laughed. And there it is, crystallised in one crisis, the stark failure of mass privatisation, the abhorrent spectacle of grasping corporations making billions while ordinary people live hand to mouth. And friends, friends, we have done it before. We have done it before in 1945. Despite the ravages of war, a Labour government made a choice to build the NHS and a more just society, where it mattered less the family you were born into and more about the contribution you could make. So Labour, now is the time to be bold, to do what it says on the Labour tin, back ordinary men and women and be their voice. The people who clean our roads, who teach our children, who look after our parents. Let's put our arms around them, like we did in 1945. And Labour, let them be in no doubt, no doubt, whose side we are on. I move. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Conference. Follow that. Every year we get up here, and every year I seem to talk about renationalising our mail, renationalising our rail, renationalising our utilities. And every year you do that because it's not only popular in this room, it's popular on the doorstep. And we need that future. We need to protect our infrastructure. We need those good quality green jobs in all those sectors. And I want to add my solidarity to every worker in the public and private sector that has fought against this pernicious government in the last few years and fought for their future of their communities. But if I might, I'll be parochial for a moment. My members have been out on strike for 16 months in a Westminster-driven dispute. We don't have a problem in Scotland, we don't have a problem in Wales, we don't have a problem in freight, we don't have a problem with open access or TfL or anywhere else. We have a political dispute with a government that wants to send my industry into managed decline. It has no vision, but it does want to keep the privateers there. We find ourselves in a unique situation. We're at war with a government but the people that we work for are making hundreds of millions of pounds and paying their shareholders. 
and that money is going to supply the railways in Germany and Italy and elsewhere. This isn't xenophobic, but if there is money that we are spending on our railways, then any surpluses, any profits should come back for a greater good, whether it be the railways, housing or the NHS. I want to pay tribute to my colleagues in Tessa who are fighting for their futures. Nobody wants to see the ticket offices closed. 700,000 responses to that consultation. So we need to commit to passenger safety, staff safety, access to the disabled and a proper fully staffed nationalised railway. My colleagues and friends, let's be bolder. Let's have that green, electrified, nationalised railway with the nationalised utilities at the heart of it and a future and a vision for all workers everywhere. Please support. Can I call the GMB? Chair Conference, Gary Smith, GMB. We have just returned from the United States and actually I'm very proud of the fact we're joining the American unions this week because the Biden administration in America is working with those unions in delivering record growth in low carbon jobs. And the contrast between the American experience and that under Sunak could not be greater. Cutting HS2, sending renewable jobs overseas and preparing the most shameful campaign in a generation, attacking workers and minority rights. This is a Tory government that's out of touch, out of ideas and out of time. Our country needs an election and we need a Labour government. And conference, conference, we need a new industrial strategy for this country with workers around the table. And decarbonisation must be done with the workers, not to them. And let's look at steel. Let's look what's happening in the steel industry under the Tories. 3,000 jobs going at Tata and thousands more are going to be lost in the supply chains. It is a devastating blow. And we must understand that electric arc furnaces alone will reduce us to working only with recycled steel. We will be importing more primary steel at much higher carbon costs. And steel workers have been ignored. When they said they wanted investment in hydrogen and carbon capture, they were ignored. And the whole of the Labour movement, party and unions must make a united case now and stand together. Conference, when the Conservatives attack workers' rights, we must extend them. When they devastate our industries, we must rebuild them. And when they come for our members' jobs, we must defeat them. Our task, our task is historic. Our economy is hollowed out. Our systems of industrial relations are unfit for purpose. We need an industrial strategy and we need a plan for strengthening collective bargaining. We need a labour response to the Inflation Reduction Act. And the commitments in the New Deal and the MPF report are essential to this task and let's celebrate them. The right to access and organise, national bargaining, social care, school school support staff negotiating body and new commitments on equal pay. These are policies conference that are worth fighting for. Our members, working people in this country are crying out for change. The policies we have developed together are part of that better future. And there are conference, of course, times when we will disagree. It's part of the health and strength of our movement. But our overriding political priority now must be the election of a Labour government. 
This is our moment, Conference. We must come together. We must rise to the challenge. Conference, support GMB members, support the steel industry, support the motion. Thank you. So this is nothing about the last speaker or what I've been asked to advise people not to speak in, not to shout into the microphone. It's proving difficult for people with hearing um, loss and hearing aids. Um, so I just needed to say that. And I didn't mean you either, Gary. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, conference chair. Alan Coombs, community trade union and a proud Port Talbot steel worker Second in the composite. I've been a steel worker for over 40 years. My dad was a steel worker and my two grandparents were steel workers. The blast furnaces I've worked on are much a part of me as my arms and legs. Steel is not just a crucial part of our economy, it's a lifeline for so many communities like mine. And for generations it's provided good quality, secure jobs but now thousands of them jobs are on, on the firing line. You may have seen Port Talbot in the news recently with the deal the government has struck with Tata Steel. Only the Tory government could spend 500 million to make our steel industry weaker, to cost jobs, not to create them. A deal so bad, so incompetent, that they didn't even have the guts to consult with me and my colleagues. An electric arc furnace only approach is central to this deal and I would retain only a tiny fraction of the jobs required to make steel. And just recycling steel in an electric arc furnace means we will need to import all of our virgin steel that's needed in the UK. Instead, the UK could be leader in green steel. They, there is a way to reduce our emissions by using a range of technologies without losing thousands of well-paid, skilled, unionised jobs. But conference, we desperately need a Labour government to ensure that becomes a reality. Lab <laughs> Labour's three billion steel commitment will be transformative in securing the long-term future of sustainable and green steel. And I want to thank Johnny, Kia and Rachel for their unwavering support for steel workers and our communities. We know that you are on our side and thank you. When we say Britain we need our steel, it's not just, it's not just a campaign slogan, it's a statement of fact. So let's give our steel industry the vote of confidence it needs and deserves. Conference, please back our industry and please support. Thank you very much. I'm moving the next Combosite, Unison. Good morning, Conference uh, Chair. Uh, Christina McInnie, Unison. Uh, moving the motion on social care workforce. Conference, remember when Boris Johnson, I'm sorry, excuse my language, uh, stood outside Downing Street and promised us that he'd a plan to fix social care? And then in his final departing insult to the country when he was resigning, he had the cheek to claim that, like a rocket booster, he had fixed social care. Well, conference, that came as a huge surprise, I think, to everyone who works in that sector or who relies on that sector. Because far from being fixed, social care is in a worse state now than it's ever been. It's propped up by underpaid and undervalued workers and exploited migrant workers. There are 160,000 vacancies in social care and thousands of hospital beds are taken up by patients who need social care. But last week in Manchester, the Tories had nothing to say about social care. They have no plan now. They've had no plan for the past 13 years. Neglecting everyone who needs it, and ignoring all the workers delivering care to those who need it most. Now, I hear people saying Labour needs to be ambitious, and I completely agree. But, Conference, what's more ambitious 
than creating a national care service for this country. Transforming the lives of one and a half million people who work in that sector, guaranteeing support for the millions and millions of people who depend on social care every single day, revolutionising one of the biggest industries in the UK made up of a predominantly female workforce. And I also want Labour to be bold. So in its commitment to the first fair pay agreement, that that will be in social care, a diverse and complex workforce, that is what being bold means. <laughs> a fair pay agreement that will empower workers and their unions to get in there and negotiate pay, conditions and training for this incredibly valuable workforce. Now you'll hear the stories say we get challenged on it all the time. We can't afford it. It's more unfunded, uncosted, frivolous, socialist spending. Well, conference, social care already costs a fortune. There's plenty of money in social care. If there wasn't, why would all these hedge funds in the Cayman Islands be investing in the UK's social care structure? They're extracting profits from social care, pushing down standards, keeping pay down for those who work in it. And Labour's commitment is to stop those immoral co companies exploiting care. Conference, we've now had 75 years of an NHS. Imagine if we were also celebrating 75 years of a social care service, a national care service. Well, under a Labour government, we have that opportunity to create that national care service. Linked into the NHS, that gives people dignity, high quality care, allows family members to stay in their jobs, gives care workers real opportunities, and gives the people who rely on care a say in what their care looks like. If you have a broken leg, you know where to go for help. You go to the NHS. But if you suddenly can't look after yourself or your family are desperate for help, where do you turn? Conference, with a Labour government, we will answer that question. It must now be our shared mission that in the years ahead, we will be celebrating the birth of a national care service. And we can look back, those of us in this room now, and proudly say, we built that just as Labour built the NHS. Thank you, Conference. Conference, Sally Jameson, uh, CLP do delegate for Doncaster Central and parliamentary candidate, seconding this motion. <laughs> Conference, I'm a proud public servant. I'm a prison officer and I'm a union rep in my workplace. And like many of you here, I see firsthand every day our public realm crumbling while this Tory government sit idly on their hands. But nowhere is this more true than in social care. In Doncaster, like most places, we struggle to recruit home care workers. And it's no surprise because the home care providers don't pay for travel time and sick pay is nearly non-existent. Is it any wonder there are over 160,000 vacancies in the sector? the worst rates for any part of our economy. Being a care worker is a difficult and it's a skilled job and they gave their all during the pandemic and we should value them, not make them suffer for the career that they have chosen. And the people who need care, the elderly, the disabled, they should be able to access it. But let's be clear, this is a national problem and it needs a national solution and that's why we need the National Care Service. 
a service that will implement national pay and terms and conditions for all workers, a service with long-term and adequate funding for high-quality social care, and a service with new rules to make sure money intended for social care actually goes on social care and not for shareholder profits. We know creating this national care service won't be easy and it won't happen overnight. But conference, we have to be ambitious. So let's support this motion, kick the Tories out and get the national care service we deserve. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Sa Sally, and, and thanks to everybody who's contributed already um, this morning. Um, so important debates that we've had, um, and I'm now going to uh, do my first round of speakers. If I just tell you as well that we will have time to continue this after lunch, um, so if I don't get everybody the first round, then we can have a look at it again. So can I see all of those who would like to speak? So I'm just going to have a look round first to see um, where we're at. Um, so, I'm not going to get in. So I don't think I've had anybody up because I don't really realise that people sat on the rake, as we would call it in, in unison terms, um, and we haven't called anybody for there. So I'm looking for um, someone with a hand up at the back. In the middle. Richard is in the rake at the back of your front right side, but with a hand up there. Yeah, there's um, someone in a, a, a florally top with hand. Yeah, yeah, there. And then behind, um, someone in a. Is that someone in an orange top? No, nope, black top. Thank you. That's two. That's two. We didn't call this guy in the blue shirt today. Which one? No. Um, it's the woman in front. It's the woman in front, yeah. And then I want to go over there to what we're looking for. I can't see where it is. A guy in the blue shirt. A guy in the blue shirt. He's on the end of the wall. Yeah. And then we'll take one more. What about the woman in red here at the front? Yeah. Yeah. And in red there. Thank you. I will come back round and I'll come over this way then. Uh, thank you. And can I just remind people you've got two minutes and if we can stick to that time then I can bring more in. Thank you very much. Good morning, Conference Chair. Angela Williams, Clwyd South, but soon to be the constituency of Montgomery and Glyndura. First time conference and first time speaker. <laughs> Comrades, at this moment... My 95-year-old mum, a great and active Labour supporter all her life, is lying in a hospital bed nearing the end of her life. She would not have wanted me to miss this conference. Her wish is to return home to her own surroundings, to the surroundings she's used to, to see the photos of those she loves in front of her, and to feel safe and more comfortable in those surroundings. She has been assessed by doctors as medically able to return home for nine days now, but the care package required for her needs to be discharged cannot at this moment be fulfilled. Nine days is nothing, I'm aware, but it's a lot to my mom and to our family. I am aware, as I work in the NHS, that some patients wait for weeks for this service, in precious beds, and that awful term, bed blockers, is used. Conference, we need to sort this out. Please give the carers the recognition, the pay, and the value that they deserve. Please support Motion 5. Thank you.
Prince Chair, Melissa Hayward, President of TSSA, speaking in support of the composite motion on critical infrastructure. Conference, in recent months we have been fighting for the future of ticket offices up and down England. Conference, they are the heart of our rail network, the heart of local communities and loved by the public. <laughs> ticket offices are the very definition of critical infrastructure, but don't take my word for it. A record-breaking 700,000 people responded to the public consultation and even Pretty Patel says the government got it wrong. So conference, let's send the great British public a strong message that the Labour Party backs our railway ticket offices and will do so in government. And conference, when it comes to HS2, dithering and delay by the Prime Minister is a scandal. Our Labour Party knows that building HS2 is vital for Britain in the decades yet to come. HS2 is vital for jobs and businesses at local, regional and national levels. That is why the National Policy Forum document states that HS2 must be built in full and that means all the way to both Manchester and Leeds. Conference. Conference, I urge you to reaffirm our commitment to the railways, to ticket offices and HS2 for the Britain of tomorrow. Please back this motion and don't let what the Tory government do set our manifesto. Thank you. Hi, Conference. My name is Nadia and I'm from Vauxhall CLP. First time delegate, first time speaker. I, um, I haven't got a speech plan, but I was just really moved by the, um, the motion on social care. My dad has worked in social care for 20 years, and I have seen as he has worked, strived, looked after people over 20 years, and I've seen how much worse it's got over, over the last, particularly 13 years. Um, I just really urge you to, to vote for this motion and support this motion. Um, I'm so proud of my dad and all the work that he's done, but over the last 20 years, he's increasingly had to rely on agency workers who don't come through, who don't know the, the people in, in, the, in the care home where he works. And he has built a relationship with, those pe with people over so many years. Those agency workers often fall through at the last moment, which means my dad has to work longer hours. Um, and he, it's really hard to, to actually look after people when it's so unreliable. Um, and he worked extra hours over COVID looking after people. And conference, do you think he's ever had a pay rise? No. If we want our social care sector to work for the people who are working there, and for more importantly, the people who we need to give care to, then we need to invest in our services, we need to support our care workers, and we need to vote in a Labour government that will, will change the social care sector and look after people the right way. Thank you. Conference, Steve Yem, a PPC for Mansfield in Nottinghamshire. And a lifelong resident of Mansfield, and I only want a single job, unlike our current Tory MP, Ben Bradley. And conference, on the subject of jobs, I grew up in Mansfield at a time when everyone had the opportunity of well-paid, high productivity, unionized jobs in coal mining, engineering, and textiles. Compare that with the impact on Mansfield of 13 years of five failed Tory Prime Ministers ending last week with broken promises around levelling up. 13 years of the Tories in Mansfield, productivity and wages down, prices through the roof, a cost of living crisis, and over 13,000 Mansfield families hit by huge increases to their mortgage payments. Increasing growth and, and getting the economy back on track is the biggest challenge that we face. Because in Mansfield, we need growth so we can improve living standards and reduce poverty. 
More than that, more better paying jobs providing the tax revenues that we need to fund strong public services. Conference, that is why Labour's first mission in government will transform the lives of Mansfield families. Jobs for you and your children in new and growing industries, wages that pay enough to raise a family on. And my message to Mansfield families, we humbly ask today for your support so that I can be a strong voice for Mansfield, listening to you and making sure that government delivers for people like us. Thank you. Can I ask you to step to come up? I'm, but I'm going to do the next round before you start. Thank you. Um, can I see all uh, guide there in? Is it orange or yeah? Stripe, the one behind, and then the third row. Yeah, yeah. And I can take one more in this round. Can you take somebody from the back if you've got two from you? Where can I take from the back? Right back, back there. Right at the back, the guide. Yeah, yeah, yes. I, I can't, we have got time for another round um, of that. So if you all want to come down and register, and then, sorry for keeping you waiting, if you'd like to start. Do you want to start? Thank you. Hello, conference. My name is Catherine Preston, and I'm chair of the Berwick-upon-Tweed CLP, soon to be called North Northumberland. So that is the North. Thank you. I want to uh, speak on behalf uh, in support of Composite 5. And I want to highlight the postcode lottery that is our care system. The lottery for pay and conditions for people who work in the care system and the lottery uh, for the people they look after. This is exemplified by Pam's story. Pam had dementia and needed oxygen 16 hours a day. In Manchester, she was kept in a first floor room, little bigger than the average bathroom, but not for long, because she had a champion, me. So, so we decided to move and live by the sea and take mom with us. So, we relocated to Berwick. There, she had a ground floor room next to the River Tweed. I had 24 access and she was kept safe by a dedicated team of people. We must support the crea creation of a national care service. We must ensure that people who need care are treated fairly across the UK. And we must recognise and reward those who look after our loved ones. Please support Composite 5. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm Kai Parry. I'm from Runnymede and Weybridge CLP. Uh, conference, I'm speaking in support of Composite 5 on social care. Uh, and I want to bring my personal experiences to the table to highlight how this motion will impact young carers such as myself. I joined uh, the Labour Party five years ago uh, because I believe that this is the only party that will truly support families that, uh, that have people with disabilities like mine. Whilst I hail from Wales, I don't really have the accent and to show how much this issue is close to my heart, I can tell you I'm frequently uh, told by the chair of my CLP that when I say the word care, it sounds a little bit like the name Kia, which you can understand causes some confusion. Uh, I did my A-levels during lockdown. Sorry for making you feel old, um, but... Uh, that's where the barrier between my home life and my academic life completely broke down, caring for my father with MS at home. Uh, the home became my classroom. And it gives me no pleasure to say that this had a huge impact on my mental health, 
results, and I'm ashamed to say, begin to resent my role as a young carer, which truly enriches my experiences. No child in full-time education should have to balance their education and futures whilst filling in for the failure of a social care system that exploits its workers. No child should resent the upbringing, their upbringing or feel stress in their own home. When we say that one of our missions is to break down the barriers to opportunity, this is exactly what we mean. I urge you to support this motion conference. Thank you. Conference, Joel Pitchford, GMB, speaking in, speaking in support of Composite 5 on the social care workforce. Conference, do you remember assembling on our doorsteps and applauding the care workers? When the government promised us that this would finally be the moment of change. Conference, I ask for one reason, because too many have forgotten. The care system relies on gross injustice to generate bloated profits. The sector has been ripe for the taking by some of the worst operators looking to squeeze every last penny into shareholder hands and into tax havens. Care workers are paid the bare minimum while residents shell out their life savings just so they can have dignity in old age. This, in a nutshell, is the business model of our care system. If this really is to be a moment of change for our care system, GMB believes we must take our lead from the care workers themselves. Care workers aren't asking for the earth. They want fair treatment and dignity and for their work to be finally valued. Labour's commitment to a fair pay agreement covering and starting with the social care workforce will give thousands of carers national bargaining for the first time. We have the chance to make it so that workers are not pushed to breaking point where they feel they have no choice but to leave to have a better life. Let's give our care workers the power to determine what they are worth. This policy will make work better for the people who care for us and under a Labour government, it can be done. So conference, please vote for justice for care workers, support Composite 5, thank you. Ivan Monkton, speaking on behalf of the Unite the Union and for our members in the steel industry, especially, despite my accent too, my fellow Welsh workers. This is crunch time for steel. It's time for this party and the government it will form to show steel workers which side it's on. If the right choices are made now, steel can have a bright future. A future built on commitment to good jobs sustained through the right investment. Unite makes no apologies that our workers' plan for steel seeks nothing short of making Britain a world leader in green steel production. From Redcar to Sheffield and Port Talbot, we have challenged politicians of all stripes to support four clear demands. One, invest in a transition plan now which commits to no job losses. Two, take a stake. Any public money must come with solid job guarantees. Three, tackle energy prices by ending rampant profiteering. And four, change procurement rules to let UK public contracts set 100% steel use, UK steel use. All sensible proposals, surely. Conference, it's an indictment that when steel workers are fighting for the future of their industry, government support is so pathetic. By changing procurement rules to focus on job guarantees and domestic suppliers, we can significantly increase public sector demand for domestic steel. Public contracts 
and all public funds awarded to steel employers must come with ironclad guarantees for jobs and union recognised rates of pay. Conference steel workers and their unions are committed to winning worker-led transitions which defend every job and make the UK a global leader in green steel production. Our members are committed to winning this future and we ask for your support and to also support Composite 4. Thank you. Hi, Conference. I'm Ollie. I'm a delegate from Congress and CLP and a proud United Union member. I, like many of you, believe that our ticket offices should be kept open. It discriminates against the elderly, the disabled, and those who don't use the internet. Ticket offices are also an opportunity for people dealing with loneliness to speak to others. This person dealing with loneliness could, could have been on their own for months with no one to talk to. Keeping ticket offices alive, taking, keeping ticket offices open could save lives. That's why I believe the next Labour government needs to keep ticket offices open for the sake of us all and our loved ones. Conference, please support Composite 3. <laughs> Can you just be ready? I'm going to do another round, but if you like to come up, that's, that's fine. Um, given we've just had four um, guys, I'm going to look for three women initially. Um, yeah, in the green and black there. Um, um, there's no one in there at the end, are there? Right at the end. Yeah, in the re red, yeah. And uh, let's come over here. The lady in the wheelchair there. Yeah. And then, um, yep, yeah, the guy there, right in front of me in the middle. I've done three. Oh, fair enough. Fraser. <laughs> and I'll take one. The woman there in the, is it red polka dot? Yeah. We may have time to do another round, but we can continue this after um, lunch. Sorry for making you wait. Would you like to start now? Thank you. Conference, Georgia Meadows, Whitney CLP. Care lever. Um, having actually been in care, I have personally seen the effects of the staff on uh, the, the effects of the staff's health, mental health, and well-being on care leavers and people in care, such as myself. It's really quite difficult to feel positively. Um, and to improving care when the staff <laughs> are so poorly treated, underpaid, and are themselves often depressed. I fully support the incorporation of a national care service because it allows for greater standardization and allows people to actually get the care they deserve from outstanding care providers. Because currently, the outstanding care providers, as given such a status by CQC, don't often accept the people who need outstanding care because they wish to keep their outstanding status. And often, more complex needs come with more complex work environments. So I do fully support Motion 5. There's quite a lot, lot of background noise when people are coming in and out. Can you try and keep the noise down? Because it does disturb um, the speakers and delegates that want to hear the debate. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, conference. My name is Lade Hepsiba Olubemi, representing Erith and Thamesmead. 
and also a councillor from the Royal Borough of Greenwich. I'm a first-time delegate, first-time speaker, and I'm here to, thank you, I'm here to support Composite 5 on social care workforce. I am standing here representing the number of overseas workers who have been recruited to fill in the 160,000 vacancies that we have in social care sector. One of the key things that has been noticed is, and I know that a speaker said that earlier, it's about the treatment that some of the overseas recruited care workers are going through at the moment. What we have in place is almost a modern day slavery where people are recruited and they're paying upfront, sometimes up to 10,000 pounds for them to come and work here. They get into the country and they're paid sometimes as minimum as five pounds per hour. I am hoping that conference, as we are supporting and as, as I am supporting this motion, that we will look very closely into making sure that we value staff who are working in the social care sector. They go through a lot, they are there all the time. I'm here to also speak on behalf of those workers to make sure that we, the, uh, we Labour Party, put a scrutiny in place to ensure that the social care sector providers are scrutinized to make sure that they give value to their staff. Thank you. Hi, Ruth Middleton, Chair of Harrogate and Knaresborough CLP, um, first time delegate and first time speaking from the platform. Thank you. As I've been listening to people talk in terms of Composite 5 about social care, I did think perhaps I won't get up and speak because everything's been said, but I think it's worth saying it again. I'll tell you a little bit of my story. 23 years ago, I survived a very serious accident and survived through a period of a long period of coma, over 20 operations as the medics and the NHS put me back together again. I survived because of the NHS and slowly recovered my speech, slowly managed to learn to live again. And the scars paled and the stitches were removed, but I wasn't really living. It was the carers who looked after me every single day who eventually enabled me to begin to live my life again, who enabled me to stay in my own house, to make decisions about where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And those carers helping with the simplest of tasks were actually the most wonderful of people. But over 23 years, the support and ability for carers to come and take care has just disappeared. Those carers have been subject to some of the worst employment conditions I've ever known. They've had very insecure employment rights. Many times they don't know who their employer is. It changes, it's so far away. They really don't know um, what a com which company they're working for. Many of the people that come to me are doing that as their second or third or fourth or fifth job that they've taken on. They're given 10 to 15 minutes to come in, to toilet, to talk to you, to wash you, to feed you, to do this whole list of things. And there is no room in there to help a person to become independent. It's all about getting in, getting those tasks done and getting out as quickly as you can. Please work with those of us who have lived experience to make sure that a national care service does what it says on the tin and actually means that we're enabling people like myself and lots and lots of people to carry on living and functioning as full human beings. And we can only do that if the staff we're relying on 
are also treated as the valuable humans they are. Thank you. Catherine Atkinson, Labour's candidate to be the next MP for Derby North. <laughs> Conference. Derby returned Labour's first MP in England, the first railway worker to enter Parliament, a city that has been building trains for nearly two centuries. But even before the Tory government took a wrecking ball to HS2 last week. It knew that there was a production gap at Alston Derby. It knew that the factory that had been making trains for 147 years was at risk. And the 2,000 highly skilled workers there and the 17,000 jobs that rely upon it was at risk. And this at a time when there is growing global demand for trains and the hydrogen and electric trains that we need to meet carbon zero. While the Tories cheered at last week's decision, do you think they spared a single thought for the families of the workers at Alston, caught in their wreckage? Conference, every speech we hear from the Tories is about decline and retreat and what our country can't do. I believe in what our country can do, in what Derby can do and what we will do with a Labour government and an industrial strategy. Conference, Alston doesn't need a handout. It needs the opportunity to bid for the trains that our country needs. And it needs a government that understands the importance of rail. Conference, help us fight the threat to Derby and to the thousands of high-skilled jobs that our country needs. Thank you. My name is Christine Bayliss and I'm the chair of Bexhill and Battle CLP and I'm a delegate here. I'm also the leader of the Rother Labour Group on Rother District Council. We have eight councillors. Six years ago we had zero councillors. I'm also very proud to be the cabinet member for economic development and regeneration on my council. And we have developed a strategy.
Let us give Britain a brighter future than ever before. One where the future is built here. Where people have jobs they can raise a family on. Have towns and places they can take pride in. And have the power over the changes affecting their lives. This is the Britain we can build. This is the Britain we must build. And under Labour, this is the Britain that we will build. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan, and you were already 15 seconds out. <laughs> so I'll take that back next time you speak. So um, thank you, um, Jonathan, for that. Um, and I now have pleasure um, in um, introducing um, to conference um, the, to welcome our Shadow Chancellor. And I've just had a little note, the next Chancellor. <laughs> on there, so promotion <laughs> And I'd like to, um, <laughs> I'd like to welcome um, the retail consultant and business expert and broadcaster, Mary Porters, to introduce um, our shadow chancellor. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and an honour to have been asked to introduce our next speaker. 800 years, over 100 names, and all of them men. When Labour forms the next government at the next election, that is going to change because Rachel Rees will be Britain's first female Chancellor. <laughs> That is historic, not just for women and for women at the top, but also because this will mean that politics will really start to work with business, to propel us forward into the new future we all so desperately need. Rachel knows that good, responsible, and the good, responsible business creates jobs. It provides security and dignity to working people. And the innovation that is vital, vital to a greener future. And today, too many businesses are failing to reach their potential. They need this long-term commitment. They need a vision, and they need ambition and a partnership between a far-sighted government and responsible business. Now, I know Rachel will deliver that as Chancellor in a Labour government. Now, I'm sure many of you are aware that I also care passionately about Britain's high streets. And I'm as frustrated as you all are to what's happened to them under the last 13 years of a Conservative government. I am absolutely confident that Labour will breathe life back into our high streets again. Rachel's committed to scrapping business rates and replacing them with a fairer system that will provide critical support to many of the small businesses that make up, let's face this, 99% of our economy, and they are the backbone of Britain. Because Rachel understands just how much our high streets matter. This is not just for the economy, but for the vital sense of community and connection that they foster. <laughs> 
She understands if you get your high streets right and thriving, the subsequent financial and social uplift feeds a local economy. It feeds a community and the safety and well-being of the people in it. She knows all that because should Labour win, she will not just be our first female chancellor. She will be the best qualified chancellor Britain has ever had. She's an economist. She knows the numbers. She's worked at the Bank of England, had a career in finance, which she gave up, incidentally, to represent the people of Leeds West. Today, she's exactly where she's supposed to be, or she's almost where she's supposed to be. So, conference, I'm delighted to introduce the Shadow Ch Ch Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rachel Reeves. Conference, it is a privilege to stand here as your Shadow Chancellor. Today, I make this commitment to you and to our country. Out of the wreckage of Tory misrule, Labour will restore our economic credibility. We will lift our living standards, make work pay, rebuild our public services, invest in homegrown industries in every corner of our country, and together we will get Britain its future back. This is a momentous week. For too long, we have gathered in these halls with the power to talk, but not with the power to do. 13 years of opposition to remind us of that eternal political truth, that it is only through power that we can put our principles into action. Under Keir's leadership, that opportunity is finally within our grasp, but only if we allow no complacency, only if we fight for every single vote, only if we work every day to show that we are the party with the discipline, with the determination and with the vision to rebuild Britain. <laughs> Labour's task is to restore hope to our politics. The hope that lets us face the future with confidence, with a new era of economic security. Because there is no hope without security. You cannot dream big if you cannot sleep in peace at night. The peace that comes from knowing that you have enough to put aside for a rainy day. And the knowledge that when you need them, Strong public services will be there for you and your family. The strength that allows a society to withstand global shocks because it is from those strong foundations of security that hope can spring. Conference, the choice at the next election is this. Five more years of the Tory chaos and uncertainty which has left working people worse off 
or a changed Labour Party, offering stability, investment and economic security so that working people are better off. It falls to us to show that Labour are ready to serve, ready to lead and ready to rebuild Britain. In chess, you learn to think several moves ahead. But even I couldn't have predicted the mayhem that we have seen, week after week, year after year, from this Conservative government. First, austerity. Then Brexit without a plan. And then their kamikaze budget. Growth weak. Wages flat. Taxes up. The price of energy up. The price of the family food shop up and mortgage bills up hundreds of pounds every single month. Never forget. This time last year, in their clamour to cut taxes for those at the top, the Conservatives caused market chaos, crashed the economy and left working people to pay the price. That is why you can never trust the Tories with our economy ever again. <laughs> what did we see last week from the Tories in Manchester? A government bereft of ambition for Britain so ready for opposition that they're behaving like they're already there. Looking inwards, not outwards, to the country. Queuing to cheer the extremists rather than kicking them out of their party. <laughs> and telling us what we already know. Liz Truss might be out of Downing Street but she is still leading the Conservative Party. The one sensible thing that they came up with was their phased smoking ban, which we support. However, I do fear for the Conservative Party. With such a shortage of fag packets, what on earth are they going to write their next policy on? <laughs> And what about the Prime Minister? Well, Rishi Sunak had the chance to denounce the politics and the policies of Liz Truss, to make clear that he would never repeat her mistakes. But he didn't. If he's too weak to stand up to them one year in, what chance do you give him five years in? Be in no doubt, the biggest risk to Britain's economy is five more years of the Conservative Party. In contrast, Labour's defining economic mission is to restore growth to Britain. But it is no use simply claiming that we want economic growth without new ideas for how we can achieve it. That starts with understanding the world as it is today. A world that has been reshaped by new technologies, by the pandemic, by war, by great power rivalries and by the climate crisis. In short, globalization as we once knew it is dead. Disruption to supply chains that span the globe has revealed the perils of prizing only the fastest and the cheapest. And our ability to make the things essential to our national security has been depleted. Great gaps have been allowed to open up between different parts of the country and we have time and time again been buffeted by global forces. In this new age of insecurity, it is no longer enough, if it ever was, for government to turn a blind eye to where things are made or who is making them, to run an economy based on the contributions of only a few people, 
a few industries in a few parts of our country. A change world demands a new business model for Britain. It is an approach that I call Securonomics. That means government putting economic security first. Security for family finances and security for our national economy. It means we must rebuild our ability to do, make and sell more here in Britain. So we are less exposed to global shocks. Governments around the world have come to understand this in a way that our government cannot. That wealth does not just trickle down from a few at the top, but rests on the contribution of the many. On the skill and dedication of those who work in our everyday economy. Care workers, postal workers, supermarket workers, and on entrepreneurs, innovators and scientists. Growth from the bottom up and the middle out. An economy rebuilt in the interests of working people. Because from security comes hope. Labour will commit itself to rebuilding that security, to restoring that hope. Labour is ready to serve, ready to lead, ready to rebuild Britain. <laughs> Conference, I do not underestimate the scale of the task ahead of us, nor the problems we would inherit in government. They demand hard work, determination, and tough decisions. The exhaustion of conservative ideas does not give us the freedom to push through programmes detached from our present economic reality or take for granted those people who we seek to represent. Change will only be achieved on the basis of iron discipline. Working people rightly expect nothing less because when you play fast and loose with the public finances, you put at risk family finances. When the prices of food and energy and housing soar, it is working people that pay that price. Like the mum that I met in Scarborough earlier this year, a mental health nurse who had moved back home with her mum for five years with her young family to save the deposit to buy a home of her own, only to find that when she was on the cusp of fulfilling that dream, after all that sacrifice, that the mortgage costs that she would face outstripped her income and she'd had no chance of meeting them. This is one of thousands upon thousands of similar stories, stories I hear wherever I go, of people who have worked hard and done all the right things, but whose dreams have been dashed by the choices of this Conservative government, people who we must not and will not let down. So a Labour government will not waver from ironclad fiscal rules, nor play the Tory game of undermining our economic institutions. The last Labour government granted operational independence to the Bank of England. I started my career as an economist at the bank, and I saw the lasting contribution that that made to Britain's economic success. So we will protect the independence of the bank the Office for Budget Responsibility and our civil service. And as Chancellor, I will put forward a new Charter for Budget Responsibility, a new fiscal lock guaranteeing in law that any government making permanent and significant tax and spending changes will be subject to an independent forecast from the Office for Budget Responsibility. <laughs> Never again, never again will we allow a repeat of the devastation that Liz Truss and the Tory party have inflicted upon family finances. Never again will a Prime Minister or Chancellor be allowed to rush through plans that are uncosted, unscrutinised and wholly detached from economic reality. But 
let me address directly those who say that to make hard choices is to make the same choices as the Tory party. To them, I say, economic responsibility does not detract from advances for working people. It is the foundation upon which progress is built. Hard choices, but labor choices. The choice to back our high streets and small businesses by requiring online tech giants to pay their fair share. The choice to levy a proper windfall tax on the huge profits that the energy giants are making. So that working people do not bear the brunt of a crisis that they did not create. The choice to abolish the non-DOM tax status and put that money into our National Health Service instead. Because, conference, if you make your home in Britain, you should pay your taxes here too, and with Labour, you will. And another choice. In my first budget, as Chancellor of the Exchequer, I will end the tax loophole, which exempts private schools from paying VAT and business rates. And conference, we will put that money into helping the 93% of our children who are in our state schools. And I tell you, if Rishi Sunak wants a fight on this, if the party that has herded our children into porter cabins while our school roofs crumble wants a fight about who has the most aspiration for our children, then I say, bring it on. <laughs> Conference, we are ready to serve, ready to lead, and ready to rebuild Britain. Thank you. I didn't come into politics to raise taxes on working people. Indeed, I want them to be lower. But the Tories have piled 25 tax rises on ordinary working people and businesses, while allowing the wealthiest to avoid taxes, keeping loopholes open, and letting government waste spiral. Taxpayers' money should be spent with the same care with which we spend our own money. I remember my mum would sit around the kitchen table with her bank statements and her receipts. We weren't badly off, but we didn't have money to spare. For my mum, every penny mattered. I learned that same lesson at the Bank of England. Responsibility must always come first. But for too long, Tory governments have allowed money to be wasted and taxpayers defrauded. So Labour will wage a war against fraud, waste and inefficiency. Today I can announce three further fronts in Labour's war on waste. First, we will crack down on Tory ministers' private jet habit. <laughs> what is Rishi Sunak so scared of up there in his private jet? Meeting a voter? <laughs> well, we will properly enforce the ministerial code on the use of private planes and save millions of pounds for taxpayers in the process. Second, we will slash government consultancy spending, which has almost quadrupled in just six years. Now, consultants can play an important role, but taxpayers must get value for money. So we will introduce tough new rules. If a government wants to bring in consultants, they must demonstrate value for money. And if they cannot, that request will be denied. 
we will aim to cut consultancy spending in half over the next Parliament. And third, we will go after those who profited from the carnival of waste during the pandemic. Today, the costs, the costs to the taxpayer of COVID fraud is estimated at £7.2 billion with every single one of those cheques signed by Rishi Sunak as Chancellor. And yet just 2% of all fraudulent COVID grants have been recovered. So I can announce today that we will appoint a COVID corruption commissioner supported, <laughs> supported by a hit squad of investigators equipped with the powers they need and the mandate to do whatever it takes to claw back the money that has ripped off the taxpayer, to take the fraudsters to court and to get back every penny of taxpayers' money that they can. Because, conference, that money belongs in our NHS, it belongs in our police, it belongs in our school. And let me tell you, we want that money back. We are ready to serve, we are ready to lead conference, we are ready to rebuild Britain. <laughs> Labour will tax fairly and spend wisely. But conference, I must tell you, you cannot tax and spend your way to economic growth. The lifeblood of a growing economy is business investment. It is investment that allows businesses to expand, create jobs and compete with international rivals, with new plants, factories and research labs coming to Britain, not France or Germany or America. But today, we lag well behind our peers for private sector investment as a share of GDP with tens of billions of pounds less spent on new machinery and new infrastructure. Is that because British people aren't as hardworking or as creative or as enterprising? No. British businesses, from life sciences to creative industries, from digital to financial services, can and do lead the world. But they have been held back by the chaos and instability of this Conservative government. So Labour will aim to restore investment as a share of our GDP to the level that it was under the last Labour government and to bring us in line with our peers. Adding an additional £50 billion to our GDP every single year, worth £1,700 for every household in Britain. But we know too that asking businesses to do all the heavy lifting while government steps back is not an option. As our competitors understand, there is a role for governments in encouraging and de-risking investment in new and growing industries. So we will provide catalytic investment through a new national wealth fund. Financial responsibility means knowing when not to spend, but it also means making sure that when you invest, you get the bang for your buck. So we will set that new national wealth fund a target. For every pound of investment that we put in, we will leverage in three times as much private investment. And conference, be in no doubt. No matter what political games the Tories are willing to play over our energy transition, no matter how willing they are to ignore the warnings of businesses, investors and trade unions, no matter how many times they put short-term political calculation over the security and the prosperity of the British people, Labour will make the long-term decisions and invest in British industry, driving down bills and creating new jobs. <laughs> jobs for plumbers, builders and electricians. Jobs for scientists, designers and engineers. 
in green hydrogen and carbon capture and storage, in Grangemouth, Middlesbrough, Swansea and Hull, in steel in Sheffield, Scunthorpe and Port Talbot, in offshore wind in Fife, in Plymouth and Newport, making electric car batteries in Coventry, Sunderland and in Blythe, and jobs retrofitting homes in Keithley, Rochester and Warrington, and in every village, town and city across our great country, ready to serve, ready to lead, ready to rebuild Britain. And conference. If we want to spur investment, restore economic security and revive growth, then we must get Britain building again. The, the Tories would have you believe we can't build anything in Britain anymore. In fact, the single biggest obstacle to building infrastructure, to investment and to growth in this country is the Conservative Party itself. Just look, just look at the fate of HS2. A major transport project lost, another promise broken, because the government could not keep costs under control. By the time this government even recognised that they had a problem, the project was already £30 billion over budget. The question must be, how was it ever allowed to get to that point? If I were in the Treasury, I would have been on the phone to the Chief Executive of HS2 non-stop demanding answers and solutions on behalf of taxpayers, businesses and commuters. But with this government, it has become a pattern. When it comes to getting things built and projects delivered, Britain has become the sick man of Europe, with HS2 coming in at 10 times the cost of the French equivalent. And that is why our Shadow Transport Secretary, Louise Haig, will commission an independent expert inquiry into HS2 to learn the lessons for the future. Because many more major government capital projects are running over time, over budget, and are in danger of going undelivered. It is incumbent on government to make sure major projects are delivered on time and on budget. I will not tolerate taxpayers' money being treated with the disrespect we have seen over recent years. I will not turn a blind eye to dither, delay and incompetence. I will hold those responsible to account. I will demand action when they are not delivering value for money. And so I have asked Darren Jones, the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, to work closely with industry experts and trade unions and to examine line by line every ongoing major capital project to make sure that on day one of a Labour government, we are ready to get Britain building again. If the Tories won't build, if the Tories can't build, then we will. We will take on our antiquated planning system. Since 2012, decision times for national infrastructure have increased by 65%, now taking four years. With Labour, that will change. So today, I am announcing our plans to get Britain building, a once-in-a-generation set of reforms to accelerate the building of critical infrastructure for energy, transport and housing, to fast-track battery factories, life sciences and 5G infrastructure, the things that we need to succeed in the decades to come, and to tackle the litigation which devours time and money before we even see shovels in the ground. And to make sure that when a local community hosts national infrastructure, they will feel the benefits, including through lower energy bills. Conference, it is time that we had a government that matched the ambition that people have for their families and communities. A government siding with the builders, not the blockers. A government that will get Britain building again. And with Labour, we will. give you one example. Our energy grid, 
Today, new developments are being forced to wait up to 15 years, until the late 2030s, to connect to the grid. 200 billion pounds worth of projects stuck in limbo. So today, working closely with Ed Miliband, I can announce Labour's plans to rewire Britain, securing the supply chain we need for lower bills, and to build faster and cheaper, opening up new grid connections to competitive tendering. And because the British people should own a stake in their energy system, the publicly owned Great British Energy will look to bid into that competition. 220,000 new jobs, lower bills for good, and energy security for Britain. And there's more. We will invest in expanding local authorities' planning capacity to speed up decisions. And here is how we will pay for it. Rocketing interest rates have dealt a hammer blow to the dreams of millions of people who want to own their own home, when already that dream was far too remote for far too many people. It is not right that while so many people are struggling, many homes are bought by overseas buyers who may own a property but leave it vacant, driving up prices while families and young people are desperate to get onto the housing ladder. So because one year ago, Keir Starmer set out the ambition for the next Labour government to make 70% of British households homeowners, because a house should be first a home and not an asset, and because, conference, it is time we built the homes our young people need, we will raise the stamp duty surcharge on overseas buyers to get Britain building. Conference, Labour is the party of the builders, not the blockers. <laughs> Labour is the party of economic growth. And it is now beyond doubt, it is Labour that is the party of home ownership in Britain today. <laughs> Working people need the skills to succeed in the modern economy and the security to utilise them. From security, hope. The parents struggling to balance caring responsibilities and work. The key workers struggling to pay the rent. The would-be entrepreneurs struggling to access the finance to turn brilliant ideas into commercial reality. A productive economy cannot be built on such fragile foundations because there is now a mountain of economic evidence that higher wages and greater job security have real benefits for businesses. And there is also a mountain of human evidence of too many children growing up in poverty, of too many parents skipping meals, of too many people waiting by the phone to find out whether they have work that day or not. So, as Angela Rayner set out yesterday, the next Labour government will offer a new deal for working people. Zero hour contracts banned, fire and rehire gone, sick pay strengthened and basic rights from day one. And conference. It was the last Labour government which finally delivered on the promise of Keir Hardy to implement a national minimum wage. The fight against poverty pay has always been at the very heart of our movement. And so the next Labour government will go further. Not a rebrand of the minimum wage like the Tories, but for the first time, a minimum wage taking account of the real cost of living. Finally, conference, with Labour, we will have a genuine living wage. of Chancellor of the Exchequer has existed now for 800 years. In that time, not one single woman has held that post. Conference, when we next meet, I intend to address this hall as Britain's first female Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> would be the privilege of my lifetime. 
But more important than that, it would come with a great weight of responsibility. The responsibility to show our daughters, to show my daughter, that they should place no limits on their ambitions. And the responsibility too, like Labour women before, to drive progress for women. Still, half a century after the Equal Pay Act, women in Britain earn on average 15% less than men. On current trends, it may take until 2044 for that gap to disappear. But women cannot afford to wait that long, and nor should we have to. The work of women have been undervalued for too long. And that is why I have asked Francis O'Grady to examine how we can go further and faster so that the next Labour government makes the next great strides towards ending the gender pay gap once and for all. Ready to serve, ready to lead and ready to rebuild Britain. We have changed this party so that we may have the chance to change our country. Labour will fight this next election on the economy. Every day we will expose what the Conservatives have done to our country. Because the questions people should ask themselves ahead of the next election are simple. Do you and your family feel better off than you did 13 years ago? Do our schools, our hospitals, our police work better than they did 13 years ago. Frankly, is there anything in Britain that works better than when the Conservatives came to office 13 years ago? <laughs> now, if you do think that Britain is better after 13 years, if you think our country is as good as it can be right now, if after all of this, you want to leave your future, your children's future, our country's future, in the hands of the Conservative Party, then I may not be able to persuade you. But, <laughs> but if, like me, you think that Britain can do better, that Britain can be better off, if you, like me, believe that it is time to put security first and reject the risk of five more years of chaos and decline, then join us. Join us in our mission to rebuild Britain. Join us in our mission to give Britain its future back creating new jobs, driving down bills, reviving our high streets, rescuing our public services, more teachers in our schools, more police on our streets, more doctors and nurses in our hospitals, lifting families from poverty, achieving energy security, and bringing growth back to Britain. We are here, ready to serve, ready to lead, and together, we can and we will rebuild Britain. Thank you. Delegates, can I just ask you to take your seats, but don't leave the hall just yet. Um, we have heard from our Shadow Chancellor, and I'm proud to introduce a short message from the former Governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney. 
Rachel Reeves is a serious economist. She began her career at the Bank of England, so she understands the big picture. But crucially, she also understands the economics of work, of place, and of family. It's beyond time to put her ideas and energy into action. Delegates, conference now stands adjourned until two o'clock this afternoon. Thank you very much.